Yeah. Um, the next presenter is Amanda Stahl. He's going to talk about drones and preparing and monitoring. Uh, Amanda is a professional resource scientist who pursues interdisciplinary research with a focus coupled on human and natural systems as related to conservation in agricultural or forestry settings. Her recent projects include the use of remote sensing data to monitor repairing conditions or forest systems. Uh, prior to earning her PhD in environmental and natural resource sciences at WSU, she received a bachelor's in geology and biology at Brown University and a master's in planetary sciences at the University of New Mexico. Please welcome Lena. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? If my voice starts to fall off and you don't hear me in the back, please make some kind of sign. Then I'll <laughs> shake it back a minute and I won't hide if I'm here. I'm so I'm here. Um, thank you all for being here. I hope you're enjoying your time. It's such a lovely place. I am glad to be here. So thank you. Um, so we're here today to talk about how we can use drones in riparian monitoring. And um, to some degree, I landed here because this was part of my PhD work at WSU. I was studying riparian conservation for my dissertation and realized that we were missing a lot of ways to tell the story of what was happening in riparian areas and that drone-based data could help fill some of those gaps. So I did a formal study at that time. So I have some stuff to share from that. Um, but also since that time, I've been doing drone work in various settings. Um, looking at different types of habitat, looking at forest health, also riparian. So I hope that today can be um, useful for all of you. I brought a bunch of stuff, but I don't really have an agenda other than to be a resource and to learn from you all what you think might be useful or what questions you have. Um, so I will go through some stuff, um, but please do think about how I can answer your questions or we can discuss options or whatever might be useful and I'm happy to adapt as we go. So if I can figure out how to advance the slide. <laughs> that works. Okay. Um, so uh, fortunately for me, uh, near WSU, we have uh, a property that's owned by WSU that is far enough away from the airport that we can experiment with drones to our heart's delight. And so I appreciate access to that place. These are some images from that place, and I'll talk about them more in a little bit. So um, I get a lot of different questions. I try to kind of batch them into three overarching questions. One is uh, what gaps can drones potentially fill? A lot of these fit under the monitoring category when it comes to riparian areas. Um, what do you need to get started? For example, if you already have access to a drone, is there some stuff you could do? If you don't, what would you need to do? What do you even need to think about? Those kind of questions. And then challenges and limitations. For example, as I just mentioned, if you're close to an airport like our Arboretum on WSU campus, where we're right in the flight path of the runway, you have to get FAA permission for every single flight versus if you're out somewhere where you're out of range, you can just fly as much as you want. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that type of thing. Hopefully those overarching questions help you think about what questions you might have because I'd really like to start out, if I can, by gathering some information from you all about sort of where folks are at coming into this room and what you might want to talk about. So if you're into this sort of thing, feel free to use your mobile device and pull up the QR code. And I'll go through a couple slides with questions. If you really don't like doing this, I'm going to have the questions on the PowerPoint and you could just kind of raise your hand and we can talk. So choose your own adventure here. I just kind of wanted to give everyone a chance to chime in. The first question, which hopefully you see, this is a bit of an experiment if it doesn't work, that's okay. Oh. Um, should be something about your familiarity with remote sensing in general for riparian areas. So the question is, have you ever heard or talked about remote sensing? Do you understand how it works, what it tells us, whether it comes from satellites or drones, doesn't matter. Um, that's what that first question is. Is this working for folks? Yeah. 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 Cool. Take a moment for me, brother. Got it. You never really know if it's going to work until you know it. <laughs> and, it works. you know, that's how it is with drones, too, is a lot of trial and error. Okay. So, okay. 
We're starting to see who we have in the room. Thank you. This is really helpful. <laughs> All right, that gives me a good sense. I am now going to move on to the next one. Okay. Anyone in the room have drone experience? This could be just flying a little tiny toy drone that a kid has or anything, or you're a pilot and you fly your own planes anywhere in between. Oh, I just paused the share. Yeah. Um, did you want to on the whole? I just have to go back to the other one with oh, one more time. Okay. No, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Hope everyone's coming up with a really good question. Is it any good? Okay. It's not critical that remote folks see the bar graph, but it just try to make it complicated. <laughs> PhD. You know, not just like push the envelope. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So we have a bunch of people that have flown a drone. It's kind of fun, right? Mostly manual flying, I'm guessing. Yeah, driving it around live. Most of what we do to collect data is autonomous flying, but first first level is you got to be able to manipulate the thing because you might have to abandon ship and land it manually or avoid birds or something. So that's great. Mm -hmm. Okay, and a bunch of people have access to a drone for work. Something that we hear a lot in our group is that people have access to a drone, but they're not sure what they could do with it that they haven't done yet. So we could talk about some of that. We've got some certified pilots, awesome, and some who are already using drones specifically. Okay, so we're gonna have some good conversations in here. That's great. I've got one more for you. Okay, and this is just, if there's any guidance you have for me on what you wanna hear today or what you wanna talk about, if you have a question, any of that could go up here. Um, and if not, of course, you can always just ask live, that's fine too. But sometimes it just makes it easier for folks if you can push them there. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good, thank you. Okay, so and I do have one more question just for the whole group, and that is what kinds of things are happening in riparian areas that you want to capture? Is it planting, some planting invasive species? Yeah, change over time. Change over time. Gravel deposition, plants growing upstream. Gravel deposition. Okay, so and maybe changes to channel morphology too. Yeah. yeah. Survival rate of plants. Survival rate. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you have any experience uh, talk about algae blooms? So yes and no, a little bit, but that's definitely a thing that we can look at. Um, particularly if they're near the surface, it gets trickier the farther below the surface they are. But we can talk about that some more too. Okay, so aggradation, degradation. Aggradation, degradation. Mm -hmm. Again, depending on seeing through water can be tricky, but you know there's more being done with that all the time. Okay, great. Thank you. That's helpful. All right, let's get into it. So um, those who are already doing drone monitoring in riparian areas bear with me or feel free to chime in too if I'm missing things. I wanted to kind of do an overview for those who are new to this to think about what are the different types of data we can use and what are the kinds of things they tell us. So there's a the contrast is kind of hard to see on the screen. It's gonna light up if I go. That's just to keep everybody awake. We're gonna stay together. Here. That's fine. So thank you though. Yeah. Always let me know if something doesn't look good. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. So one of the one of the really basic things we can do is we're just documenting the area, right? We can say we have this these different species or these different types of plants or this soil is is uh, uh, exposed or gravel or whatever. This is where the channel is. We can make a map of the area. Um, everything that comes out of the drone is geo referenced. That means it can go into GIS. We can take some extra steps to make sure that we can detect change over time. 
down to, I mean, depending on how we do it, we're going sub-meter resolution for sure. So we can be really specific about what's happening in an area and telling the story of what's happening with change over time if we take that extra step. We can count plants depending, of course, on what type of plants, what's around them, how low we fly, what kind of sensors we have. So we'll get into that type of thing. We can look at the structure of plant communities, right? And this also applies to anything on the ground surface, the topography um, with uh, height and density data. So I'll talk about how we do that. Um, we can look at greenness. There are various ways to look at greenness, depending what kind of sensors we have access to. There's really fancy, expensive sensors that can do an amazing job, but a lot of times that's more than what we need. So I'll give you kind of an introduction to how to think about that. Um, and then one of the really key things with drones is unlike satellites, we can fly them when we think it's important to fly them. If there's an invasive species we're trying to track and the flowers bloom at a certain time and that's the best time to tell the difference between that and other things, that's when we fly. If we need to look at patterns of change through the growing season, that's what we do. If we want to look at patterns of heat during the day, we can fly multiple times in a day, in theory, if all the other logistics work out. So that's some of the power um, and some of the gap that can be filled. So in terms of oops, in terms of use cases, hopefully uh, trying to get this down to something that you can think about in the context of your own projects, even if you haven't thought about this before, um, the before and after, right? Like you have before and after someone does a major landscaping project or remodels their house. We can do this with restoration. Um, and again, if we have these georeferenced data points, then we can quantify change over time, which can be really powerful, both visually and quantitatively to tell our story. Um, individual plant survival and growth can be tracked different ways, depending on what sensor you have and how you collect the data. Um, if you want to customize your drone flying to do that, you might do things differently than if you're trying to cover an area. So really what you're using it for will dictate how you fly, what you fly, all those kinds of things. Um, habitat characteristics, they come in all shapes and sizes, right? So depending on what kind of organism you're thinking about or if you're thinking about ecosystem functions, maybe that's what you're aiming for. So there are a lot of those types of things. We can be looking at cover or uh, different canopy heights, all those kinds of things. Um, or just if we're looking at a uh, percent riparian cover for salmon habitat restoration or something like that. Then we have patterns in plant health through time, right? So if we do, if we fly once every five years or through the growing season, whatever it is, we again have georeference data on plant health. So we can quantify that change over time with caveats and such. Um, then of course, species distributions, if we can map it once and we can georeference it, then we can measure change over time. Um, and something that's really neat that about drone data is those images we then archive as data and we can go back to them. So if a new question comes up, wait, when did that weed first appear? Or any other kind of question, you now have an image archive. Or the person who's out in the field maybe doesn't know something that someone back in the office knows, then you have this complete picture you can bring back and get other opinions on. So there's a lot of power of this image archive that's really neat, I think, uh, going forward that we'll have more and more of just from people collecting more drone data. Any questions at this? Okay, drones can do all these great things. They're really fun and cool and they can help tell the story. But I always encourage people before you dive into using a drone, it's really important to pause and consider these things. Um, first, because you might decide you don't need the drone at all, or second, because it really might help you prioritize what and where to use a drone. Um, so one is there's a lot of free imagery out there. Sometimes we can do what we need to do with free imagery, and then we should save our money and time to do something different than fly a drone there, right? Um, a huge question is scale. If you talk to people who do remote sensing, they always talk about scale because that's everything. We're always trading off how much detail we get versus how much area we can cover. Um, and sometimes you really need a drone to get the detail that you need over the area that you need. Um, and then of course the timing of change, like I talked about before, if you have a certain thing that happens at a certain time, or you really need to fly when it's cloudy and all the satellite sees is clouds. <laughs> so it can be really helpful in those cases. Um, 
These are the major players in terms of remote sensing for riparian areas, at least in my experience in Washington. How many of you have heard of the Sentinel-2 imagery? Many of you have, some people haven't. It's kind of like Landsat in that it's moderate resolution imagery. It's from the European Space Agency, only it's 10 meter resolution instead of 30 meter. And this means that we can see, okay, for, for most individual sites, it's gonna be too coarse. I'm gonna show you what that looks like. Um, but if you're looking at a series of stream reaches or you're looking at the watershed scale, it can do a lot of stuff. So always good if you can to check what the free imagery can show you. It comes back every five to 10 days. Um, so even if it's cloudy a lot, oftentimes it's flying frequently enough that we can piece things together and get good coverage, and we can measure change over time with 10 different bands from the spectrum, gives tons of information. Um, great for BSP type stuff, not always great for site scale stuff. Then we get into the NAIP, how many of you heard of it or worked with it? A lot of people. So this is the aerial imagery from the USDA, they fly airplanes, they have these sensors. Um, that's going to be once every three to five years at one meter resolution. So again, if you're looking at stuff much finer than one meter, it's not going to work. We'll talk about that more in a moment. And then our drones, which can get really fine up to sub centimeter resolution on demand, one side at a time. So what does that mean? Um, I just pulled a square of Icicle Creek just up the road here with Sentinel-2 imagery, just to give you an idea of what 10 meter squares look like. So you don't see much. I mean, I don't see much. I see fuzzy squares. I see some fuzzy squares. So for most riparian areas, that's going to be two font, two cores for the site scale. If you zoom out, you're going to see a lot more. Now, if you go to the NAIP imagery, the aerial imagery, you can start to see individual trees. So if you're just tracking an area that's green or a bunch of trees over some years, this may be adequate for you. So always important to start with what you can work with. So um, yeah, so there's the store. Here we are. This uh, square here is that random square bicycle creek that I just showed you, or sentinel imagery. I thought I'd just give a quick overview of what that square looks like in the common freely available imagery we work with, right? So we have Google Earth. Everybody's familiar with Google Earth. Um, hit or miss what timing they're getting, but really good detail, right? Then we have uh, the NAIP next to it, just so you can see what that looks like. That's true color, so red, green, and blue, what a regular camera has. Something nice about that is they also have a near-infrared band, which means we can calculate an index of vegeta vegetation health, which I like to show in these false color images. So here, the red means the vegetation is really active. It's photosynthesizing. It really pops out, so I find that really helpful. Here's our fuzzy squares from Sentinel in the same true color image, and then also in the same false color image, just to give you a sense of what you can see, okay? And then drones are gonna get us finer than that upper right picture or the upper center, depending what kind of sensor we have. <laughs> um, just to give an example of where the NAEP imagery can really help show us what's happening. Um, in this example, that scale bar is 200 meters. And this is an area where there was a grazing exclusion. So the riparian vegetation was able to grow and grow over time. So in the area in the oval, you could see that red, bright red vegetation has expanded from 2009 to 2017. So over eight years, you can see some change. So limitations of this imagery though, um, it's only gonna show up every two or three years, depending on where you're looking at. Only one capture per growing season and we can't control when that is. And sometimes the county will be covered partly in May, partly in October, you know, so really hard to tell. Um, and that band that allows us to do the false color is only available since 2009. So really can be really helpful, but we can't compare directly. We can't quantify directly the differences in vegetation health because they had different sensors on those different airplane flights. So that's another limitation that we wouldn't have with the satellite imagery that we do have with this one, just to give you all a sense. Folks still with me? Yeah. Okay. So um, again, remote sensing, I have to show the spectrum just to remind everyone what we're working with. Most of what I talk about today will be passive sensing, which means we're just getting what's reflecting from the electromagnetic spectrum, what are things absorbing and what are they reflecting? It has a certain signature of what it absorbs versus reflects. Most of what we look at is gonna be in this visible light part of the spectrum and a little bit into the infrared. Um, 
And so what happens is, uh, as I said, everything, every feature has a signature based on what it, what energy it absorbs and what it reflects. I want you to focus on the yellow green lines here. That's the vegetation. So vegetation absorbs red. That's what the chlorophyll does. A lot of the energy coming from the sunlight is in that red. And so we get a drop in red reflectance with plants and they really strongly reflect near infrared, which is over here. So you see the curve go right back up in the near infrared part of the spectrum. So we can use that to get really strong signals like those bright red trees popping out in that image I showed you. You can still do this with the green because plants reflect green. That's why they look green, right? So you can compare green to red if you just have a regular camera, but it's not going to be as strong of a signal. So we deal with these trade-offs where the multispectral sensor we need to use the near infrared is a lot more expensive. Is it worth it? Is it not? Depends on what you need to tell. So what I would say is if you have a true color camera, see what you can do with it, max it out, and then decide if you really need to upgrade to something more expensive. So I started talking about sensors. Across the top are the use cases we already talked about. And I kind of made this matrix to help summarize what we can do with different sensors. I'm gonna walk through it, but please don't take this as the truth. It's just to give you a sense of what piece of the story we can get from each type of sensor, okay? So a why doesn't mean it gives us everything. It just gives a piece of whatever that thing is, all right? Um, so starting with the true color, we call it RGB because we have the three bands, red, green, and blue. That's how the data is stored. Um, so that can give us a before and after snapshot. It can be geo-referenced and in fact, will be automatically geo-referenced just because it was riding on the drone. Okay, but it's not going to be, there's going to be maybe up to 30 feet of slush if you want to align it from one year to the next, for example. So you'd have to do something else to get a better alignment if you needed to measure change more accurately than that. But that said, you can definitely do before and after both visual and quantification just with red, green, and blue. You can also look at plant survival and growth. I mean, as long as your plants stand out enough that you can see them, then you're gonna be able to count what plants are there if you have enough resolution, if you flew low enough for whatever it is that you wanted to capture and you weren't gonna crash into something when you're doing that. Um, in terms of plant health, as I mentioned, we can use the red and the green bands to make the plants stand out a little bit more. They're not gonna be as bright red as in that false color image, but they will stand out more. So you can track plant health in that way. And then of course, species, if you can recognize them, you can map them, they're a field reference. And then have tech characteristics. It depends what it is in detail that you're looking at, but a lot of that you can get just with the red, green, and blue. Um, now, again, if you have a red, green, and blue sensor and you can plan an autonomous mission to take lots of pictures at lots of different angles, then we call that structure for motion photogrammetry, and it allows us to build a three-dimensional surface of whatever we see. And so here's where we can get height, density, all that kind of thing. And then every point on the point cloud it makes or the surface that it generates has those values of the red, green, and blue band. So there's a lot we can do. I'll give you some examples of what that looks like. So then that one is going to give us the shape of the surface, but it's not going to give us plant health. Okay. Multispectral, that's anything where we have more than red, green, and blue. The most common one you'll see is near infrared, and that one's really useful for vegetation, as we mentioned, because that gives us that really strong reflectance to compare to the red and make the vegetation really pop out. Multispectral can go up to lots of different bands, up to 10. You could have hyperspectral even, which has gazillions of bands, where you could get really specific identifying species. Those start getting really expensive. Um, Thermal, we can look at drought stress. We can look at different, uh, we can look at the landscape in terms of the thermal pattern. Um, and then LIDAR is active sensing. So with LIDAR, we're shooting lasers at things, right? And counting how they come, how those points come back off of things. So I'll show you some examples of what LIDAR looks like too. Okay, and then there's the question of cost, right? So. Kind of my favorite is the really cheap old drone that I was able to use when I was a PhD student. 
This is a 3DR Solo with a GoPro on it. It's one of the first consumer drones that came out. Um, and I use pool noodles as our ground reference point, so it doesn't have to be super fancy. It got GPS data for those points. With that, I was able to make those three-dimensional surfaces that I was talking about. So if you take enough pictures at enough angles, there's really a lot you can do with a consumer, any consumer grade drone setup. Um, then with a the commercial setup, we can do a lot more. Uh, this one on the left is a DJI on the trees that can carry a multi-spectral camera, a thermal camera, that type of thing. And then uh, we also have in our lab a 300, which can do LiDAR, and I'll show you what some of that looks like. Okay, who's a drone pilot who's going, wait a minute, what's happening with DJI? <laughs> Anyone wondering? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, there's a blacklist and the federal, all of the federal departments and federal lands on using drones that have Chinese parts or were made in China. DJI is a Chinese drone, but even if you have a drone that's not made, that's not from a Chinese company, it probably has Chinese parts, unless it's on the blue list for the Department of Interior and Department of Defense. Unfortunately, those drones are made for military purposes and not really for what we do. So we are stuck in a place that a lot of people are stuck in right now where our really great drones can be used on private lands and still on state lands in Washington, but not on federal lands. And federally funded projects cannot fund this work. So um, a lot of companies are working on trying to fill this gap, but we're in a little bit of this weird time where our hands are a bit tied in terms of federal federal projects. So there's still a lot we can do, but um, I don't know if anyone has any other updates who has experience with this, um, but just something to be aware of and be careful of. It's not a good time to go out and buy a DJI drone or really any drone, unless you get a really good deal on it and you know you're gonna be able to use it on private lands for a while. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, and just to mention, <laughs> so once you have a commercial setup, you can start switching out the sensor. You can do lots of different things with it. Um, you can have a fixed wing drone that'll fly a lot larger area. Won't be as agile as one of these copter style drones, but it can cover a much larger area. So we can do different things with the different ones. Usually better to start as simple as possible. So here's what it looks like. You plan a mission, you recon an area, you figure out where you can fly safely. Before you do that, you get permission from the landowner or whoever else, adjacent landowners too, so they don't shoot it down, um, other agencies, whoever's involved. Um, once you have that permission, you need to figure out for your drone, what's the software you're gonna use to plan an autonomous mission? Particularly if you have a consumer grade drone, it's not gonna have, it's not gonna come with software that does this. There are lots of software options for doing it, but you're gonna have your drone fly in a grid and take pictures exactly where you want to get enough coverage of the area to get what you need, stitch the images together, make sure they're nailed down with location and all this stuff. Um, and then you're gonna fly it, which again, may not be the software that comes with the drone. So whenever you get a new setup, if you're gonna do these autonomous missions, you need to have all this stuff figured out before you can start. The good news is once you have it figured out, you can just keep on using that same system. Okay, so then we go out and we fly our drone, it does its thing and we watch it really carefully and we interrupt if we need to to make sure it's safe and it collects all these pictures or it shoots the LiDAR laser and collects all the LiDAR beams coming back. Um, we need to sometimes experiment to know how much overlap we need between pictures, both in um, forward and sideways, because it's gonna do this zigzaggy pattern back and forth. And then again, if we wanna really nail down the location to measure change over time, or if we wanna build one of these 3D models, we usually need to have targets on the ground that we have GPS data for. The better your GPS data, the better you're gonna get as an output from it. More and more, the expensive drones have this built into them, so you don't have to do this as much. This takes a lot of time, but costs less. Um, then we have, uh, in our lab, we have a program called Agisoft Metashape. It actually, uh, I'll show you what it looks like. It figures out where all the pictures go based on how the drone was and stitches them all together. Um, and then there are various options uh, for different software. Pix4D is one that a lot of uh, organizations use, and they have different levels that you can pay for depending on what you're going to use it for and how much, how often you're going to use it. 
Um, so then out of this, we get GIS files and a point cloud. So we get GeoTIFFs for anyone who's familiar with GIS um, uh, that are the stitched image with a geolocation and then also that height uh, DEM, the digital elevation model, the height layer, um, and then a point cloud for anyone who's familiar with that. So that's a three-dimensional model. I'll show you what some of those look like. Okay, and then remember from that, we get to figure out what we have where, what it looks like in one at one point in time. And we have all those, uh, whatever bands were in our sensor plus that height point at each one of those points. Okay, um, so here's an example of what it looks like um, in the software. The blue, the blue planes are the restored locations of the camera when it took each picture. And then the software matches up all the points and all the overlapping pictures and uses that to make this 3D model that's partly covered by the zoom controls, sorry. <laughs> um, but you can see there are these trees sticking up there. And so every point is a data point in that model. And then this is an example of the digital surface model we get. So this was this was not an actual data collection event. This was just a quick demo flight where I did zoom out and back. So all those little circles are places where it took pictures. And just from that little bit of information, it was able to start reconstructing those trees. And you see here is the height scale. So you start to really quickly get a model out of this. And then, as I said, every point has data. So in this example, we have that vegetation index for every point on the top and sides of the trees. <laughs> Okay, let's look at some actual pictures. You already see some actual pictures of riparian areas. Um, this one is actually a current project that we're working with the Palouse Conservation District to help document. So they're um, they're going to be doing all these plantings where all these black tarps are. So we're planning. Well, we have the before. We're planning to do some after photos. So we'll be able to show where the plants are, and as they get larger, we'll be able to track their growth over time. Um, this is what the whole area looks like. Um, in this case, this is an example of LIDAR imagery in a canyon. So if we get this three-dimensional model, we can rotate it around and look at it. But here you can see um, from here over is the area where the project has been implemented in the past. And here above is where they're trying to get funding to do some more. So you can really start to see the difference between areas that have the dense vegetation, the complex canopy versus not. Um, in terms of plant survival and growth, uh, in this one, um, I'm in the creek. We have our favorite weed canary grass along the banks here. They've been trying to get these ponderosa pines to grow along the banks. Um, and so in this image here, you can see from the surface model, all these lumpy things are ponderosa pines so we can see from the top. So we get a different view than we would get on the ground, but sometimes it helps tell the story of a place that we wouldn't be able to get just from measurements from a site visit. Okay. Um, and so if you see up towards the top, the, the yellow is outlining the buffer. Towards the top, they've had a really hard time keeping those trees alive. So for some reason, the earlier generation survived and the younger ones didn't. Um, but you can really capture those patterns with this type of thing. So this was with that solo, the old consumer grade camera um, that I did this. And then you can put it all together. Here, I just kind of faded out the true color image and overlaid it over so you can see how it all looks together. Um, so for this one, I did have to use those ground control points and high resolution GPS, but I did do it with a consumer grade drone. Um, and so to do this, we do uh, what we call double grid. So we fly the area twice at 90 degrees to each other, um, and then we fly different altitudes. And that's what helps us really get that 3D view. Okay, um, here's another example. Okay, you see the shadows are huge in this one. October is not an awesome time to fly, but things happened and this is when we ended up flying. So we just want to try to minimize shadows. We try to fly around solar noon and we try not to fly in October, but sometimes you just need to. Um, so in this case, you see the trees still look red, but they're kind of like muted out, right? Because they're slowing down. They're getting ready to senesce for the winter, but they still show up. Um, and we're still able to make our 3D surface. So you see in the upper one, there's the little bumps. Those are the younger plantings. And then the larger bumps are the older plants. 
same setup for this one. And then I also flew it with a commercial drone to be able to get that false color image. I'm going to zoom into this area just to show you what it looks like when we zoom in. So you can see over here, this is the reed canary grass growing along the edge of the stream. Gives you a sense of the resolution. This one needs to fly pretty high so it didn't crash into trees. But if you wanted to really focus on something along, if you really wanted the details of the, what's happening along the creek, you could fly really low and get a lot of finer resolution. Okay, and then in terms of plant health, this one is in a riparian area, but I think the nice one shows um, this is in the forest near Missoula, and we're looking at insect damage to trees. And here, because we're looking at the top, we can see patterns of top kill where the trees are getting attacked and they're dying from the top. We can see which ones are still alive but fighting and which ones have died. And this all this stuff is usually monitored with satellite and nape imagery, but they cannot pick this up. So it shows that kind of unique scale that we're getting. And again, this is with one of those multi-spectral sensors. So uh, plant health, if you want to really get details of plant health, the multi-spectral sensors are really helpful. Um, this is circling all the way back to the Hudson Reserve I was telling you about near WSU, where we can do some experimenting. And this is to show you what we can get with a multispectral sensor that just has five bands. <clears throat> and for us, if we do this at the end of the growing season, our riparian areas really pop out, makes it really easy to see how that vegetation is doing, and a lot of the other land is turned down by them. So you can see the true color at the top, that's the red, green, blue. And then here's our false color where the vegetation really pops out. Then we can calculate these indices. Some of you are familiar, NDVI, you've heard this before, plant health. So we can do that, but that saturates really quickly and the whole thing looks like a bright white ribbon. But with the red edge band, we can start to see where there are shrubs, where there's structure underneath the trees from including that one as well. So those are the five bands we have on that one. Okay, and then just to show you what those individual images look like, um, you're looking at the tops of willow trees here. Down low, there's canary grass, some forbs, a stream channel that's kind of choked with canary grass, and sometimes we have some um, shrubby dogwood and woods roads, that kind of thing. Um, just to show you a little with a thermal camera, this is actually looking at talus slopes. Um, we're looking at habitat for critters that live in rocks, but um, you can see, anyone want to guess what that blue patch is? If red is hot and blue is cool? Vegetation? Yeah, yeah. It's tree, a patch of trees and shrubs. So in the middle of the day, um, the rocky slopes are kind of bluish. The red areas are actually former roads because it was like quarried out and they're bright red. And then you can see all the vegetation as this really cool. So we're looking at climate refuges in this situation. Um, also just wanted to show an example, uh, again, with just the consumer grade setup here. This is the riparian area in a canyon. So you get the topography of the canyon walls, the topography of the channel where it's exposed. And then you get the trees and shrubs, kind of those different heights in there. Um, oh, and I just wanted to zoom in again to show, uh, this is the 3D surface, so here you can see these lumpy looking things, those are the trees and shrubs that made that blue uh, thermal refuge. Okay, so, summing it all up, um, when, we use, when we do use drones, we can pick those key times to capture. We get views we couldn't get on foot, like the top kill of trees, that type of thing. Um, and then we have all these different options, right? So again, if you're just getting into this or you already have access to some kind of drone, always do what you can do with what you have first, I would suggest, and then see what else you can get into. And all this together can help really complement field data and sometimes satellite data to tell the story of a project. Never one data source is going to tell the whole thing, right? But sometimes it can really help fill those gaps. Um, okay. So some people in the room, some people here have certification, right? If you want to fly a drone for work, you have to have a Part 107 certification from the FAA. Um, you can study for this online and take the exam. You have to go take the exam in person, and then you refresh every 24 months with an online exam. So that's something that is not too onerous to do, really important, and you learn a lot of safety stuff when you do it. 
Permission, of course, all of you are familiar with permission, so I kind of glossed over it. Um, just like you get permission to do anything else, but sometimes people are extra nervous about letting a drone fly. Um, so what I have done working with Palouse Conservation District is have a memo and really lay out everything. Um, and also assure people we're only taking pictures straight down. We're only taking pictures of the area they approve that we're not gonna use it for anything else. We're never gonna associate their name with it outside of what we're doing and, and this sort of thing. But a lot of people have been really excited about it and then they want the pictures, you know? So it could be a really positive thing. Um, there are a lot of safety considerations that I'm happy to chat with folks about if you're interested. Um, let's leave it at that. That's kind of a whole other thing. Something to remember too is this 3D surface that we make it only gets the top. Um, and so if you're really interested in what's happening under the canopy, you may either need LIDAR or something else. We're experimenting now with handheld photogrammetry with iPads on a stick, I call it. Um, there are some different things you can do. The biggest limitations we usually face are with batteries. Um, you, can't, you can't fly past your battery. Um, depending on your setup and how many pictures you're taking and what you're doing, um, you can be really limited with battery. And we always have to maintain line of sight. So again, that can be tricky, especially if you're in steep terrain or there's, you know, if there's a lot of vegetation of different heights, that can be pretty tricky. Um, and then of course, we need training to deal with all the stuff, the, all the data that we get. Um, and that's something that, um, you know, our lab is happy to be a resource. If you wanna reach out and ask us questions, we can help you figure, figure things out, but it does take something to get set up with that. So that's what I had prepared for you all. I was hoping to leave a bunch of time, but I leave time. Yeah. Um, I really like to hear what questions you might have or what drones you have that you're not sure what to do with. Um, and I have some other pictures I'm happy to show if they if that comes up and it's relevant. So thoughts, questions. Yeah, we need to I'm kind of stitch together. So what we use in our lab is Agisoft Metashape. That one is a one-time purchase, but we were able to get an educational discount, so that helped us out a lot. So we can do contract work too, if that's helpful, if you really don't want to deal with it. Um, but there's also PIX4D, which I think offers a free option or a pretty low cost option for simple stitching. It's just if you want to get into that more complicated where we have the targets on the ground and doing lots of images that then you might have to upgrade to do that. Um, but yeah, that's, and there are some other open source software options out there if you're just stitching images together. Um, so the biggest thing is to make sure your images overlap enough. I mean, typically you want 75% overlap minimum for it to really stitch well. Otherwise they have trouble recognizing and matching the points across. Did you have a question? Yeah, kind of a similar one. Um, I don't know if you mentioned this, but I've been pretty much just so far flying manually to stay in practice, but mm -hmm. eventually we are hoping to look into, you know, doing the mission planning beforehand. What like application or like software would you recommend for that? So it does depend on what kind of drone you have, but one I'd recommend trying is PIX4D Capture. Okay. That's a free app that you can download and then it's really seamless to work with the PIX4D stitching. So in my opinion, that's probably the best one for conservation districts to try out. Okay. Um, and if not, there's, a, there's others, um, but it's really user-friendly. You can just do it on your mobile device. So it could be a tablet or a phone. Nice. Um, yeah, and so that's that's quite good. Ground board is very user-friendly. You have to pay for it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it does everything you need underneath their 3D model. And pretty much what we'll do the program, what it says, and we'll email it uh, with math and model them. Yeah, drone deploy is really commonly used, especially for folks who do quite a bit of flying, I think. Yeah. So I ran into issues with big for you. Thermal, one, two, going to uh, mm -hmm. stitch together thermal imagery or drone deploy both. That's good to know. So, drone deploy did better with thermal. Mm -hmm. um, thermal imagery is tricky to stitch and it requires more overlap than just so, true so color. Yeah, we'll we'll oh, really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Fix 
four days without a red coffee spectral. And I haven't had any trouble with that, just soft on any of them. It does them all. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, this might be a silly question, but I haven't started looking into it yet. But so for center options, are those like add-ons that you can purchase and like a smash to your drone that you already have, or is it like a specific drone that you have to buy? with a certain sensor. So the question is, uh, what are the options for different sensors? So most consumer grade drones, you have to use the camera that it came with. Mm -hmm. um, I do know a professor who strapped, he just strapped a camera <laughs> to the leg of his drone. It was a thermal camera and it actually worked. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not gonna recommend that because that's gonna really <laughs> throw off your payload and probably gonna crash. But he did that and it worked. Um, so typically you're looking at a commercial grade drone to be able, so if you're going to be shopping for a drone, you really want to think out what are the sensors I might want to use, even if you're not buying the sensors right away to make sure it's capable, because if they're not compatible, then you're just stuck. Yeah. Um, and, and that can get expensive. And, and I wouldn't buy, I mean, if you use federal funds, I wouldn't buy anything until you're sure that it's on the blue list. Um, and so we're waiting for more affordable and appropriate drones to show up on that list. There's a bunch of companies working hard on that right now. So hopefully that'll happen soon. Hmm? Do you know the differences between blue list and NDA uh, compliance? That may be the same thing. So the blue list is just the list that the Department of Defense and, and Interior put together that had, like, they worked with these companies and said nothing in the drone comes from China. Right. So the same thing. Uh, well, I know what the blue list is, but I was just not entirely sure what NDA is uh, talking about. I talked to another person in here about that before. I didn't have a chance to kind of dive into it yet. Yeah, I'm not sure. And then the tricky thing is they're... Um, so for example, Parrot is a European company and they made a drone that's really secure, you know, and it's all the data is secure and it's fine in Europe, but it's not okay here for federal. Yeah, so yeah, because we bought one <laughs> um, and then found out we couldn't use it for, um, for federal products. So learn from that. Uh, yeah, be really careful about that for sure. <laughs> Have you done any protocol point monitoring stuff with drones? Just so what uh, program and everything that you found to work well? Like if you like have a to have your drone go to the same location, the same get volume and everything, take that same picture multiple times. I have not specifically done that, but all of our missions that we plan are saved. And so they could be rerun at any point and it would do that. So you could have a mission of one point that does that, but I haven't done it yet. All of my, uh, my first round was in 2019 and then COVID. And so I never got to go back and do my repeat flights. So I'm still hoping that one day I'll be able to go back and then we'll repeat exactly the same mission. And that's the idea. Haven't got to do it yet. Mm -hmm. uh, you briefly talked about looking like into the water, and I know that most uh, light uh, bands kind of reflect off the top of it, so it's really difficult. But do you know if any sort of uh, sensors or any sort of technologies are able to kind of see into that to give you an idea of like anything growing in there? For me, so that would be a really good piece of data for our community. Yes, there are a couple of things that I know are in the works. One is the idea of the coastal blues. So there are some of the blue bands that can see better, and you could do indices with those that can see better through the water. Um, also, my colleague uh, has been counting salmon reds. I've read about them. Yeah, um, and he has used a circular lens and puts filters on it, and they fly, I'm giving too much away, they fly the azimuth of the sun angle to minimize the glare from the sun. Mm -hmm. And they try to minimize shadow by flying their solar noon. And he's happy to talk to anyone who wants to talk more about imaging underwater. Um, could, is there like, could we, I didn't set this up, but maybe if anyone wants to just write down their email or something, then I could, we could connect if you have follow-up questions. Um, any other? Hmm? Uh, you mentioned the apply to the suit, uh, 
Not yet. I mean, I don't see why not. I feel like everything would be really similar, except they just wouldn't be long strips necessarily. It would just be a different, a different shape. But um, yeah, and if depending on what's there, I mean, when you have a mix of trees and short things, you, you kind of have to fly above the trees. Um, but if you have a big enough area where you can get down low, you could kind of mosaic those together and get some nice um, multi-level definition there. Mm -hmm. Sort of on the same note, are there any species that don't show up or you're not able to get good indices like this? Like I do most of the blood work, but I would imagine, again, same sort of things would work just as well in those environments. Yeah, yeah, and I have been flying in, in forest settings too. Um, yeah, I mean, if you want to get really specific spectral signatures of individual plants, you're probably getting into hyperspectral imagery, which is really expensive, really cool. Um, but uh, I have been trying to use the phenology of plants to separate them. Um, one of my colleagues has been looking at post-fire recovery and trying to look at the timing of shrubs versus trees when they turn green or not green to try to distinguish. So it, you really need to know your system and really think critically about what your system is and how, if you were in the sky, you would be able to tell the difference. Any other? Um, I'm kind of new to this, but I guess I'm interested to know, maybe this is related to MDI, I'm not sure, um, the plant moisture, and how can you just talk a little bit about that, because it'd be kind of interesting to see if we could detect the amount of moisture the plants have post-treatment. Yes, so, uh, for one thing, typically to sense moisture, especially if you want to get into soil moisture, there's an SWIR, short wave infrared, that can be really useful for that. Sometimes you can get at it indirectly by looking at drought stress, um, if that's kind of what you're thinking about. So um, if you have a good thermal sensor, you should be able to detect drought stress. Also, sometimes NDVI can show drought stress too. There's a lot of work, are we out of time? There's a lot of work being done. Yeah, yeah. In agricultural settings to look at that. I mean, tons of work in crops and forests. Um, so we can translate that to riparian areas and, and try to figure it out. I think we're out of time. Thank you all so much. It's been really